The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? So here I was, the successful businessman the fast tracker in the organization who everybody thought had it all together. And I am alone, and I'm living in this lovely home with a dog that I just don't like. <laughs> you see, despite the many accolades that I had received and the many affirmations, I was getting some feedback at home. My wife notified me that she was actually leaving. And I felt an overwhelming sense of shame, embarrassment, sorrow, and fear. And you see, this wasn't the plan. I thought I had done everything right. I was building a solid base of expertise at work. I was building an immaculate resume of experience, things that included Dartmouth College undergrad, Wharton MBA by the age of 24, general manager of a Fortune 500 by the age of 30. I was a brother on the move until it all crashed down. And the irony of it all was that on one side, I've got this scorched earth program, and on the other side, I'm being written up in Fortune Magazine, Black Enterprise. I was in a local, small local paper. And the headline of the paper, I was on the front page. And it said, Mark Belton, the perfect executive. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I actually had to ask myself some pretty hard questions. And um, in retrospect, or in hindsight, I realized that I was just a Christian at the time who was suffering from mistaken identity and the collateral damage issues that are associated with wearing a mask. And, um, you know, that was profound, you know, for me. Just absolutely profound. When I talk about mistaken identity, I'm not talking about a legal tactic in a court case by the defense, i.e., it wasn't me. Okay, I'm talking about workplace Christians who have actually are mistaken as it relates to who they are and they've ignored the fact that God has created them and that they're in his image and their identity and they are called to actually move and go forward. Now, what I found is that with Christians, this thing, mistaken identity, is kind of hard to spot. We are model employees, diligent, hardworking, tend to work well with others, we know how to play the games, and we have the trappings of success to show it, especially for folks who work in the workplace. You've got all the stuff, you can name it, I don't have to. But make no mistake about it, folks who suffer from workplace, um, from mistaken identity, actually really struggle, and they lose the freedom and the flexibility um, to do the great things that God wants them to do. They become powerless. So the essence of my talk actually today is to actually encourage you to think about putting down the mask and actually picking up the unmistakable face of a Christian. So why don't I take a second, let's kind of uh, illustrate the different masks that we have. First mask I want to talk to you about is the Oz Christian. And I call that OZ like the Wizard of Oz. If you remember the story of the wizard, Dorothy and her friends, after much tribulation, arrive at the Emerald City. And uh, they enter the castle to see the wizard. The great ominous face is there. They're all intimidated until a little dog named Toto runs along the side and pulls back the curtain. And what do they see? They see a little old man in there, whirling his arms and twirling. So the Oz Christian is a person who spends a lot of time puffing themselves up. They are ever insecure and ever fatigued because this takes a tremendous amount of work. And one interesting thing about the Oz Christian, you know, when you're working on puffing things up, you also spend a fair amount of time 
putting people down, okay? Whether that's passive aggressive behavior or nitpicking or just the put down, which we see a lot right now. The second group I wanna talk to you about, I call the Christian in disguise or the undercover Christian. These are folks who have camouflaged themselves to blend in. They are like characters inside a Robert Ludlum novel. They're always on the run, they're always hiding. Fear is their currency and their primary motivation. And as we look at scripture, in Proverbs it says, fear of man is a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord is kept safe. So these folks are actually ensnared by their fear of man. And you know what a snare is like, the more you move and tussle, the more ensnared you get. So as a result, these Christians become really ineffective at doing anything for the kingdom. The third group I'd like to talk to you about, I call the high tower Christians. And if you look in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, it's the great story of the Tower of Babel. You all know it. What do they say? Let us build a city and let us make a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we might make a name for ourselves. And the operative there is making a name for ourselves. How do you do that? Accomplishment, status, or things that actually refer back to accomplishment or status, the things that you've actually achieved. The high tower Christian has a currency, you know, which is about advancement. But what you do find is that these folks are like Dow Jonesers. They are up and down with the market each and every day. Did the boss say something nice? Did the pitch go well? It didn't go well. Oh my gosh, they're always grinding. They're ever grinding and ever striving. And it makes them ineffective because they're always reaching for other types of things. So what I would just try to say is, you know, what masks are you wearing? And do you see any collateral damage associated with it? And what's fueling you? The next thing I want to do is talk about the other side of the story, which is the unmistakable face of a Christian. First and foremost, they are unclouded in their identity. They know they're made in the image of God. They know they're royal because they're sons and daughters of the king. And they also understand that they're ambassadors sent on a mission to do the king's business. Next, these folks are unshakable. Their roots run deep in the Lord. They understand that problems will come and trials and tribulations certainly are part of our lives, but they know that the Lord is the one who defends them from each and every one of those. Third, these people are unselfish. They know God has a plan for them, so they don't have to grab at everything. In addition, they're generous. They know their God gives with an open hand. So as a result, they can give of their time, their talent, and their treasure. So my first question for you is, is hey, who wants to be on the mask side? No hands. Who wants to be on the other side with the unmistakable face of a Christian? We all do. We want to be there as consistent as possible. Now, there's a huge problem with this. On one side, you've got the face, the other side, the unmistakable, and there's a canyon that's in between these. And if you're even remotely honest with yourself, you have to admit you've tried to scale the canyon, you've tried to jump it, and you know that you can't. It's just too wide, can't be done. Well, there's good news. The only way you can get from one side of that canyon to the other is with the Lord Jesus, okay? He's the bridge who can bring you over. There are some other problems, though. Many of us will have to surrender some things to get to that other place. He can't just be your savior. He must be your Lord and King. And if you aren't willing to turn it over, that means you're not ready to give up the mask. Okay, so let me give you some helpful ideas as you kind of walk this out. First and foremost, hook into the book. <laughs> Scripture says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Those are wonderful flowery words. We know what they mean. Reprogramming. You have to have your mind reprogrammed and try to do it on a daily basis. And I have been in a situation where I've been reading God's word now for 
a few decades every morning with a book cover to cover. And if you would have seen me back in the day, you'd see me with a Bible, my journal, and a commentary. And I'm furiously going through this, writing things down, praying about them, and trying to walk to work with a new mind because I knew things were messed up in my life. So I had to get serious about the book. Now, one of the things we notice today is that we are over-bibled and under-read as a society. They say there are four Bibles in every home and less than 25% of the people actually read the book, which drives me crazy. I can't understand it. We live in the most volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world of all time. And here you are not anchoring yourself in the word so that you might discern what is right and what is good and what is necessary. Second thing you ought to think about, get into a group. I have learned over time that it is probably more important to live your life in a circle than it is to just spend your time sitting in rows. There is something powerful and profound that happens when people get together and sit face to face with one another, sharing their issues, sharing their challenges, getting support and receiving wisdom from one another. I'm in a group of cats and we call ourselves the Bereans and we are 12 guys and we're like the United Nations of Brothers. We have some very simple things that we actually try to do as a group. We read books by godly authors. So thank you all here for these wonderful books. We'll scan some and find some for our group to read. We spend time breaking bread. We pray. We obviously ask questions about those books with one another and challenge one another. And then we support one another through great fellowship. We have one simple rule. Whatever happens in the diner stays in the diner. So there's trust. And then we move forward. And we have seen God do some unbelievable things with us. I've seen the Lord smooth over marriages and unfray the frayed, okay? I've seen God help with this group walk brothers through cancer and issues with their sight. I've seen the Lord bring us all through joblessness, employment, unemployment, reemployment, change of jobs, retirement, the whole thing. God does it all. And we have actually even had an impact at the diner. The staff comes in, will ask us for prayer. And they're not asking us for prayer because we're holy men. They're asking us for prayer because we are humble men. Okay, our hearts are bent before the Lord. Last thing, ask the Lord for a mentor. I was fortunate. I knew my situation was shook. I said, Lord, I actually do need some help. And he gave me Carrie Humphreys. And we are the odd couple. He is a classic Southerner. And I am obviously a bit of an East Coast New Yorker. He's been my spiritual father for 25 years. And I found it so important to have a picture of success. You know, someone that I could look to and say, hey, how can this be done? How do you walk inside the workplace with a level of integrity and performance and grace? You know, how do you juggle your family and make things right and put them where they need to be placed, right up in front? And how do you serve the king in a way that makes him smile? So one of the interesting things I'll just say is ask God for a mentor. And don't be surprised if you see the Lord tapping you on the shoulder and asking you to mentor someone else. OK, we truly need it right now. It's absolutely essential. So the essence of this. Uh, Offsite is to actually, and this is what I read, that they want, you want to fuel the faith and work movement by helping to create whole life disciples. I hope from my talk you've gotten a clear sense that carrying a mask is fundamentally incongruent with actually being a whole life disciple. And even more importantly, I hope you just get a sense that you know, there's a better way. There's a better way to actually live this thing out. So if you feel like today God is somehow tugging on your heart about this issue, or you feel like maybe there I'm starting to see some collateral damage, and maybe this mask is getting really, really heavy, today might be your day to actually turn it over, put it down, surrender it to the Lord Jesus, and let him live and work in you in a much more fundamental way because the times actually demand it. Thank you very much and God bless.